Dallas Theological Seminary's Chapel Podcast. Today's chapel speaker is Dr. Nathan Holstein, Assistant Professor of Theological Studies. He received his uh, BS in, from Louisiana State University, his THM from Dallas Seminary, and his PhD from the University of Aberdeen in Scotland. He's worked full-time in engineering as well now as in ministry, and has also served as an adjunct professor for the Criswell College and for the Dallas Seminary before he joined our faculty in 2005. His interests include especially encouraging students to be fully engaged in the world outside the walls of the seminary. And he loves to discuss the development of theological systems, especially in Reformation and post-Reformation contexts. He and his wife and family are very active at the McKinney uh, Church in Fort Worth. Uh, he's married to Janice and they have two children. Uh, would you join me in welcoming Dr. Nathan Holstein to our chapel class? So I um, decided to unstick two pages in your Bible today by preaching on the second letter of John. So go ahead and see if you can find that, second John. And, and while you're looking, I'll tell you that they asked me to choose a hymn for the chapel. And I was looking for the one that says something like, um, Oh, still the tongue of deceiver, don't let him in your door. He'll spread his poison in your church and go in search of more. <laughs> but it turns out that's not in our hymnography, so kind of a challenge to find a hymn that goes with Second John. But we'll get to that in just a minute. Have, have you ever wondered where the phrase, your name is mud, came from? Well, it turns out scholars argue about this, and you thought we argued about some weird things? Scholars argue about this, but one of the most popular stories is that it began with the, assassina the assassination of President Abraham Lincoln. You remember the story, how John Wilkes Booth shot the president, jumped from the presidential box onto the stage at Ford Theater, and broke his left leg in the process. In his flight from the scene of the crime, in his flight from Washington, D.C., he ended up uh, visiting uh, Southern Maryland and came across a doctor named Samuel Mudd, who set his leg and to make a long story short, Dr. Mudd was eventually convicted of conspiring to assassinate the president. He was given a life sentence for his aid to Lincoln's assassin. The, com the, the popular story is that it was the public, it was the public contempt for Dr. Mudd's action that gave rise to the expression, your name is Mudd. The strange thing about this story is that Dr. Mudd's descendants, his grandson, even as late as 1988, petitioned then-President Reagan to set Dr. Mudd's conviction aside. Reagan apologetically refused, so Mudd persuaded the, the younger Mudd, because the older Mudd is gone by now. <laughs> the younger Mudd persuaded two representatives to introduce a bill clearing his ancestor's name, but the bill failed in committee. Not to be deterred, the younger Mudd turned to the Army Board for Correction of Military Records, arguing that Mudd's conviction should be overturned since he should have been tried by a civilian court when in actuality he was tried by a military court. This appeal extended until 2003 when the U.S. Supreme Court refused to hear the case on the basis that the deadline for filing had been missed. <laughs> That's 
just funny to me. Oh, yeah, we would hear that, case. so you're just like 100 years late. <laughs> All this, oh, by the way, the news is not good. His name is still Mud. <laughs> All this goes to show that apparently simple actions can be the cause of great misunderstanding, and well-intentioned deeds can produce grave Results. And that, in a nutshell, is one of the lessons we learned from 2 John. So if you would turn to 2 John, I'd like to take a look at the guts of this letter. I'd like to read verses 7 through 11. This is 2 John, verses 7 through 11. For many deceivers have gone out in the world, those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch yourselves that you do not lose what we have accomplished, but that you may receive a full reward. Anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. The one who abides in the teaching, he has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into the house. Do not give him a greeting, for the one who gives him a greeting participates in his evil deeds. Not an easy passage, and now I regret having chosen it. <laughs> there are a number of challenging issues in this passage, but I'd like to break it down into three major ideas. The first idea that we encounter here is the, the problem. There is a problem, and the problem seems at first glance to be pretty clear. The problem is a number of false teachers were traipsing about leading folk astray. Uh, that's pretty, it's pretty easy, right? The problem with that reading is I don't think it captures what John is actually saying. There are a couple of phrases that might confuse us. First, the phrase Many deceivers have gone out, and gone out into the world, apparently carries echoes of other Johannine thought arising from other Johannine passages. The phrase going out, which it uses the aorist of exerkesthai. Ex See, I, I was going to not stumble on that because <laughs> there's all these Greek scholars over to my right. I'm not going to look, but are they doing okay? <laughs> This aorist of exerkesthai might imply that the going out was actually a departure from the Johannine community. If, if this passage further is parallel to 1 John chapter 2, and you know the famous snippet, they went out from us, if there's a parallel there, then the point may well be the deceivers in view here are actually some from the Johannine community who no longer teach doctrine that conforms with truth. They're us. Second, the specific point of the doctrinal departure is described in this verse. These deceivers did not acknowledge Jesus Christ coming in the flesh. Now, there's another exegetical challenge here, a grammatical challenge here, because the present participle coming might naturally expect to speak of the second coming of Christ. If, if I say they don't teach the coming of Christ, the normal, the normal slant might lead you to think I'm speaking of Jesus' second coming. But to take this as a reference to the second coming ruins the parallelism that numerous readers have seen between this passage and 1 John chapter 4, which uses the perfect participle to refer to Jesus having come in the flesh. By the way, you're in good company whichever way you go, but it seems to me that the coming in the flesh here is primarily a reference to Jesus' incarnation. It's his coming the first time. I should think that this teaching in, John, in 2 John is a preview of what we're going to later read in the Nicene Creed. Those famous words, by the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary. 
and was made man. Now we might have a clearer picture of the problem John is describing. It's this, a significant number of teachers all wearing Apostle John baseball caps were making the rounds, going to various churches, and teaching others a non-Johannine, a defective Christology. Oh, and by the way, as you know by now, it's all about the hat. Amen? <laughs> so now we have a better understanding of the problem. The problem is not just that there are false teachers. We know more than that. There are false teachers that came from the community of faith. They were part of the community of faith. They were part of the Johannine community. And now they're going out and they're teaching something John can not affirm, a sub Christian Christology. Jesus has not come in the flesh. This is the problem, which leads us to the second idea, which is the challenge in verses 8 and 9. Watch yourselves that you might not lose what we have accomplished, but that you may receive a full reward. Anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. The one who abides in the teaching he has both the Father and the Son. I grew up in Topeka, Kansas, where nothing ever happens. <laughs> Watching grass grow is the state sport. My friends and I all thought, when we graduate from high school, we're getting out of here. And it's only as I get much, much, much older that I realize Topeka is a great place to raise a family. Ah, but I'm off on a tangent. It's a great place, but it was, shall we say, just a little sheltered. So I left Topeka and uh, enrolled at Louisiana State University in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. My first day, culture shock. <laughs> in Kansas, we don't have surnames like Melanson, <laughs> Boudreau, Douai. In Baton Rouge, I found no one speaks English. <laughs> Imagine my surprise then when the first voice that I can actually understand is a young man trying to sell me marijuana. <laughs> this is definitely a Toto, we're not in Kansas anymore moment. <laughs> that was going too far. That was just, that I was not ready for that. That was going too far. But, but hey, just to clear things up, before you draw the conclusion that everyone in Baton Rouge was a dope-smoking pothead, let me set the record straight. There were only a very few of those. It was just primarily the faculty. <laughs> uh, oh, oh yeah, we were talking about too far, weren't we? Too far. That, maybe that was too far. The challenge brought about by the problem. The challenge is some might go too far. The danger implicit in the, the teaching of the deceivers is portrayed by using two negative images. Image number one, losing what we or you have accomplished. And yes, there is a debate over the pronoun. Talk to the New Testament department. I don't. <laughs> two negative images. Image number one, losing what we or you have accomplished. Image number two, not having God. This is what happens if you follow the teaching of the deceivers. However, responding appropriately to the deceiver's teaching is portrayed by using two positive images. Image number one, receiving a full reward. Image number two, having both the Father 
and the Son. And what separates these two alternatives is either going too far or abiding in the teaching of Christ. Take your pick. Abide in the teaching of Christ or go too far. The consequences are demonstrated for us. By the way, on this abiding in the teaching of Christ, on this phrase, many innocent droplets of ink have been spilt in discussions on the teaching of Christ. This is one of those places where you're going to use your courses in New Testament exegesis, wrestling with the objective genitive. Is this the teaching about Christ? Or the subjective genitive? Is this the teaching that comes from Christ? My response to this is, why are you looking at me? Do I look like I wrote a Greek grammar? <laughs> but my second response is this. Looking at the context of 2 John, all the way from verse 2, which says, the truth which abides in us, to verse 4, which speaks of walking in the truth, to the nature of the deceivers in verse 7. All of this seems to me to suggest Jesus is truth, and truth is Jesus. And as a result, I see an objective genitive here. This is the teaching about Jesus, namely, He is the Christ. He is the eternal Son of God who actually, literally put on flesh, became a man. I apologize to those who see a subjective genitive. They're probably right at the end of the day. But now I have a clearer picture of the challenge. Here's the challenge. Do not, do not under any circumstances purchase from one of these deceivers a sub-Christian Christology. If you do, you will not have a living relationship with God. If you stick with the truth, however, which is only found in the true Jesus, you will have a vital relationship with both Father and Son. So we've met the problem, we've seen the challenge, and John brings us to a command in verses 10 and 11. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, by the way, there's another reason I see an objective genitive, the teaching that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into the house. Do not give him a greeting, for the one who gives him a greeting participates in his evil deeds. And this, quite honestly, is the hardest part of the whole letter for me, because I immediately have in my mind this, this image of inviting someone into my home. I have a scriptural command that forbids me from giving someone like this a friendly wave. But I don't think this passage is encouraging incivility at the door of a private home. Two ideas seem to me to suggest a more contextually valid meaning. First, the word house, which is oikia here, could refer to the house of assembly, the place where the church met. Yes, I am aware that Paul often uses the form oikos for this meaning, but I rather think that the house of meeting, the church, makes better sense in the context of 2 John, especially when give him a greeting could honestly refer to the official recognition granted by the church to someone allowed to teach there. Here's the crazy thought. When we invite someone to speak in chapel, there's an invisible affirmation that you don't even have to think about. You know it's there. Unless we say something specifically to the contrary, like Dr. Holstein is teaching today. Don't listen to him. <laughs> Which I understand was making the rounds by email. 
But unless we say something like that, we give our implicit affirmation to those whom we invite to teach. And perhaps this is a better way of understanding. Do not give him a greeting. It's the official recognition that opens the door for the faithful in the church to not only listen to a visiting teacher, but to support that visiting teacher as he continues on his rounds. And so now, I think we have a better understanding of the command. It's not, don't say hi. It's not, slam the door in their face when they come to your home. I think it makes much better sense to say, do not allow anti-Christian teaching at your church and do not aid deceiving teachers in their ministry of destruction. Or, if I may, insist on teachers who are distinctively Christian. <laughs> Did I do that okay? Did I do that all right? By now, I think the application to your life and to my life, to your ministry and to my ministry, is clear. There are those today who wear the name of Christ, and yet they teach something that is not Christian. Do not let these deceivers teach in your ministry and do not aid them in their ministry of deceit or your name is mud. Will you pray with me? Father, the truth of Jesus Christ is a blessing beyond anything we could have ever imagined. We who were rebels, we who shook our fist in your face, you have chosen to love and to redeem in his blood. We have no thanks that would make this right. We have nothing to give you that could earn this kind of love. But we recognize as we, read your, as we read your word that the truth of Jesus is also a sacred trust. Father, our prayer today is that you would strengthen us that we might protect that trust defend that truth that we might be those used by you to encourage the church and to help her grow so that the name of Christ might be lifted up among all the nations. This is our prayer. Amen.